Our Father, we thank you because of your hand upon us. You have brought us to this workers' retreat so as to commission us so that we can reach out and be of help in saving the people that are perishing. We have heard your voice. We have surrendered ourselves. We are going to do what you want us to do. And we pray that as we have vowed, as we have consecrated, we will never turn back in Jesus' name. Use us for your glory. Use us to bring sinners into the kingdom of God. And use us to establish believers in the kingdom of God. All that we have said, all that we have given unto you, we pray we'll never take anything from the altar in Jesus' name. Speak to our hearts again. In Jesus' name, we pray. In Genesis chapter 4, we're reading verse 9. And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? The Lord had asked the first question in an earlier chapter, a previous chapter. And he said, Where art thou? After man has discovered where he is, and he has done something about it, the next question that God poses to man is, Where is thy brother? Abel was a true worshiper. He believed God. He loved God. God accepted him, accepted his offering, accepted his sacrifice. But through jealousy and envy and hatred, Cain rose up against him and he slew him. He cut off Abel's life. He cut short Abel's service. He cut off Abel's ministry. And he cut short Abel's prospect at a stroke. And then God questioned Cain and said, Where is thy brother? When Cain responded, his answer or response showed that he did not know that he had a responsibility of protecting and keeping his brother. He asked, Am I my brother's keeper? The Lord will want us to know today that we're not living alone. We're not living in isolation. We are our brother's keeper. All the people we know by name, and even people we do not know by name, their salvation is on us. Their interaction or reconciliation with the Lord is on us who know the Lord. And if their lives are cut short, or their ministries and services are cut short, or their prospect in life is cut short, the Lord will be asking us, where is thy brother? In Ezekiel chapter 3. Ezekiel chapter 3. Verse 17. Son of man, I have made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore, hear the word at my mouth and give them warning from me. The Lord called upon Ezekiel. And he told him he was a watchman over the whole house of Israel. Obviously, Ezekiel did not know every new baby born in Israel, but was a watchman over them. You may not know all the new babies that are born in this city, in this state, in this nation, 
But God says, whether you know them or not, you are a watchman over them. Ezekiel did not know all the poor people in the house of Israel, in the nation of Israel. But he was such a watchman over them. You may not know people that are dying of hunger, of cold, of nakedness. You may not know the people that do not have adequate shelter on them. But he was, you are still a watchman over them. Ezekiel would not have known the population or the proportion of the women over the men in the land of Israel. He didn't know, but God said, you better find out quickly. Because I have set you a watchman over the whole nation of Israel. Did he know how many villages there were in the land of Israel? He might not have known. But God told him, I have made you a watchman over the whole nation of Israel. The same thing is telling us today. Because you are your brother's keeper. You may not know all the villages that there are in this, in this stage or in the nation. But it says, I have made you a watchman over the people. Did Ezekiel know the people that are the brink of death? Those who are about to die? Those who are so sick, there was no hope for them. And if they died and they were lost, their blood would be required at the hand of Ezekiel. Because all those sick people that were about to die in the land of Israel, Ezekiel was a watchman over them. You may not know the people that are dying, about to die in this city or in this state. Or in the nation. And God is saying, I have made you a watchman over them. Ezekiel did not know the women that have gone so far in immorality. That it appeared they were beyond hope. And yet, God was telling Ezekiel, you cannot write off anyone. The women that have gone so far in immorality. That it appears that they are beyond hope. You are still a watchman over them. Better find out about them. Where they are. And how to reach them. Ezekiel may not know the dialects of all the people. That means the local languages that they speak. But he said beyond their language reach for their soul. Beyond their culture reach for their soul. And you may not know. All the dialects that are spoken in this city. All the languages that are spoken in this city. Beyond the language. Reach out to them. Reach for their soul. Son of man. I have made thee a word man unto the house of Israel. Therefore, hear the word at my mouth. And give them warning from me. We don't know. Ezekiel might not have been popular or known to the governor of the nation, to the leader in the nation. The nation, might not have, the nation might not have singled out Ezekiel to vote for him, to elect him as their prophet preacher, as the watchman. But God told Ezekiel, don't worry about whether they know you or not, whether the governor has recognized you or not, whether the people of the land even accept you or they don't accept you. You are the watchman over them. They have not appointed you. I have appointed you. The same thing the Lord is telling you today. You are your brother's keeper. The people may not know you. They may not recognize you. They may not look up to you as the prophet preacher. But he says, I have set you. I have made you a watchman unto the house of Israel. I have not made you another thing. Any other thing the world makes you is not of my making. Any other calling the world gives you is not from me. The only thing that is on record in heaven is that you have been made a watchman unto the whole house of Israel. What was Ezekiel to do now at this time? He ought to begin to plan 
how to reach the children, he was a watchman over them. How to reach the women, he was a watchman over them. How to reach the poor, he was a watchman over them. How to reach the villagers and the illiterates, he was a watchman over them. How to reach the decision makers in Israel, he was a watchman over them. How to reach religious people that were going to temple and synagogue without knowing what the worship of God meant. He was a watchman over them. If he folded his hand after this time, if he closed his mouth after this time, if he acted unconcerned after this time, if he did not go with the vision and run with the vision after this time, there will be judgment upon him. Verse 18, when I say unto the wicked, Thou shalt surely die, and thou givest him not warning, nor speakest to warn the wicked from his wicked way to save his life. The same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thine hand. Ezekiel from this time could no more shrug his shoulder and say, It's not of my concern. If they drink and they have accident and they die, it's not my concern. If they keep on smoking and they have lung cancer and they die, it's not my concern. If they are immoral and they have AIDS or they have venereal disease or incurable disease, it's not my concern. If they are fighting over land and they begin to charm themselves and they kill themselves and they die, it's not my concern. God said, Ezekiel, Everyone that dies in the house of Israel, if you don't give them warning, it's your concern. I will require their blood at thy hand. That means then you are a watchman. And then you are to take care of them. And show them the way unto life, life eternal, so that they will not die. And not only over the people that are sinners, but over the righteous as well. In verse 20, again, when a righteous man does turn from his righteousness and commit iniquity, and I lay a stumbling block before him, he shall die. Because thou hast not given him warning, he shall die in his sin, and his righteousness, which he has done, shall not be remembered, but his blood will I require at thine hand. What it means is, if we do not give righteous people the continual opportunity of hearing the word of God that will establish them, stabilize them, confirm them, and they die in backsliding, and they turn away from the Lord, we might say, is their fault? They know the church is there at Bagada. They know the church is there at Ayobo. They know the way to get there. They will not say they do not have a Bible. They will not say they have not listened to, listened to cassettes. They will not say they have not read our magazine. They will not say they have not read the books. After all, they were born again before. After all, they were righteous. After all, they knew the way to know the Lord and to keep with the Lord. So if they backslide, it's their problem. God says, I will require their blood at your hand. Can Ezekiel now go on his way and just be spiritual and not carry all the people that are righteous in the nation along with him? He cannot. If he did, he will die. He will perish. No matter how righteous Ezekiel was, if he failed to carry on, to carry along the righteous people in the nation. If those righteous people, if they turn from their, from their righteousness and they commit iniquity, they will perish and then their blood will be required at the hand of Ezekiel. Can a watchman get into his vehicle and then leave other righteous people that do not have means of transportation? And he says, that's their concern. My car is my own. I will go all alone in my vehicle. If those righteous people that you leave behind, if they die, their blood will be at your hand. Can a righteous man say, my wife is too slow. I will not allow this, my wife, to drag me behind. I will not be late to church. 
And therefore, she knows the way to the church. She knows when the church uh, service is starting. And therefore, you get into the vehicle and you leave your wife behind. If she backslides, her blood will be on you. Can the wife say, I don't want anything to be a stumbling block on my way. My husband already, he knows the way of God. He knows the way to the church. He knows how to read the Bible. If he doesn't want to have quiet time, if he doesn't want to go to church, and if he is acting tired, I'm not going to allow anybody to hinder me. I'm going to heaven. Can the wife go to church without carrying the husband along? Without uh, helping the husband, encouraging the husband, and helping the husband to see, my husband don't get hurt, Jesus is coming, we must go now. Can the wife, the believing wife, go all alone? No, if the husband dies in sin, his blood will be required at your hand. Can the parent now just go to church and say, all these teenagers, all these my children, I don't know what the gang they have joined at school, that is making them not to be interested. All this uh, rebellion of the young people today. I'm not going to allow any child to hinder me from getting into the kingdom of God. If uh, they don't want to go to church, good luck to them. I am older than they are. I know the way of the Lord. I will go to church. I will follow the Lord. Children, I have called you. If you refuse, your blood is on your head. It's not so, daddy. It's not so, mommy. If they perish in sin... Their blood will be required at your hand. Can a person who is living with another brother, after you have seen that this brother is, a lead, is a decreasing his a quiet time, is decreasing his prayer life, uh, you see, that's what they do when they are thinking about marriage. That's what they do. That's how they act when they are thinking about money. That's how they act when they are thinking about their relatives. But... Even though we are living together, I'm not going to allow anybody to hinder me from getting to heaven. And then you pack your Bible, you pack your tracts, you pack your study scripture, and go to church. He knows the way to the church. She knows the way to the church. And uh, if she does not follow and go to the church, that's his lookout. She will not say she does not know, because she knows if she perishes, she's on your head. If he dies in sin, it's on your head. You are your brother's keeper. When a righteous man does turn from his righteousness and commit iniquity, and I lay a stumbling block before him, he shall die. Oh yes, the soul that sinneth, he shall die. But he's not the only one that will die. Because thou hast not given him warning. He shall die in his sin. And his righteousness shall which he has done shall not be remembered, but his blood will I require at thine hand. The Lord is impressing it upon us tonight that we are our brother's keepers. Let's turn back to Exodus chapter 4, verse 27. Exodus chapter 4, verse 27. And the Lord said unto Aaron, Go into the wilderness to meet Moses. And he went and met him in the mount of God and kissed him. Moses ran away 40 years before this time. He had done something wrong. He killed an Egyptian. The following day, he saw two Israelites fighting and struggling over a matter. He went near them and he tried to settle them. One of those people rejected him and pushed him off and said, what is your business in our matter? Do you want to kill me like you killed the Egyptian yesterday? And the news began to spread of the evil that Moses had done. Moses could not stay. He ran, he escaped for his life. In Exodus chapter 2, verse 15. Now, when Pharaoh had heard this thing, he sought to slay Moses. But Moses fled from the face of Pharaoh and dwelt in the land of Midian. And he sat down by a well. But you remember Aaron as being a senior brother, older than Moses by three years. But 
When Moses ran away, Aaron never followed him. Aaron never asked about his welfare. Aaron never sent a messenger to him to say, how are you doing? Are you, are you free from your guilt, from your body now? Forty years had passed. Aaron never wrote a letter unto Moses. Now, God came to Aaron in verse 27 of chapter 4. And the Lord said unto Aaron, go into the wilderness. Don't you know your brother is there? Go after him. Go into the wilderness. Why are you staying in the city here? Why are you staying under comfort? Under security? Why are you staying in the shelter, in the home here? Go into the wilderness. Somebody is there waiting for you. His name is Moses. Welcome him. Encourage him. I have given him a work to do. He is afraid to come back. He is thinking that nobody will receive him. Go after him to the wilderness. Encourage him. Forty years have passed by. Run after him. Forty years have gone. Run after him. Time seems to have covered the life of Moses. And the ministry of Moses. Run after him. Even though 40 years have separated you, and you seem to have forgotten now his stature, his special appearance, you seem to have forgotten all his qualities and characteristics. After these 40 years of separation, Aaron, leave everything you are doing. You are your brother's keeper. Go after your brother and bring him to the elders of the land of Israel. You see, God will not forget that even after 40 years, Moses was still a brother to Aaron. God will not forget. After four years, or five years, or ten years, of brother so-and-so who has gone into wilderness, of brother so-and-so who has gone into Midian, of brother so-and-so who has gone into a strange land, maybe before he left, he wasn't married. Moses wasn't married before he left. Now he had married a stranger. Now he had got two children. Now he had even forgotten he will ever come back to the children of Israel. Now he had even forgotten that the call of God was still upon his life. But God has not forgotten him. The people that you knew who went away. Is it four weeks ago? Is it four months ago? Is it four years ago? Or is it 40 years ago? They've gone from the Lord. Run after them. Go into the wilderness to meet them. And he went. Aaron did not argue. Aaron did not say, but what I about the shame? Because he may accuse me. What are you doing all these years you didn't ask of me? You are just looking for me now after 40 years? What if I had died? He forgot the shame. He forgot the possibility of accusation. And he went and he met him in the mount of God. If you go after them, you will meet them in the mount of God. Because the presence of God will be there. The Lord will reunite you together. And you will be an instrument of bringing them into the fold again. God has need of them. They are tied down. Because of the shame of what they have done. They are tied down. Because of the abortion they committed, they are tied down. Because of the murder they committed, they are tied down. Because of the adultery they committed, they are tied down because of the sin they committed. Run after them. Women representatives. Don't you know people who are women reps before and are not now? Do you even greet them? Do you search for them? Oh yes, we know they are not serious. We know that they don't want to continue the word of God. Is that what you are going to say? Zonal leaders. Do you know people who are zonal leaders before, but now they are discouraged and weakened, and they are no more doing it? Do you ever run after them? Members of the choir. Do you know members of the choir who are there before, and are no more there now? Do you run after them? Ushers. Do you know ushers who were ushering before? I know some of them. But maybe they did something wrong. And they ran away, ran away from the church. Maybe now they have gone to marry. Maybe now they have gone to settle down. Maybe you see them on the street. When you see them on the street, you say, look at him, he's going to perish. 
but you also will perish with him because his blood will be required at your hand. Sisters, don't you know some sisters that were fervent in the Lord before? Maybe they were not workers, but they were coming to the church because of marriage, because of jewelry, because of the cosmetics of the things of the world, because of the customs of the world. They ran away. They said, I cannot bear that. You see them in the street. You see them everywhere that you go. But you just say, ah, look at her now. Look at the way she is dressing now. You cannot shake hands with her. You cannot embrace her. You cannot weep over her. You cannot have fellowship with her. You cannot bring her back. You are saying, ah, she is going to perish. Will you be alive if she perishes? Her blood will be required at your hand. Brothers, don't you know there are people because of ordinary television. They said, ah, if it is like that, I cannot stay. I cannot remain. And you, by the grace of God, you are what you are only by grace. And you are still standing. And uh, you are making fun of that. Person. Ordinary, because of ordinary television. That's why that brother could not stay. Well, he wants to perish because of ordinary television. My brother, if he perishes, will you be alive? If he perishes, will you get to heaven? If he is lost, will you get to heaven? His blood will be required at your hand. How about the people we have ill-treated? The people we have oppressed. And because of that, when they could not bear the hardness, the hardship, the oppression, they ran away. What are we going to do about them? Because we are our brother's keeper. The case of Moses and Aaron teaches us something. As long as God has not written off a brother, we cannot write him off. As long as God has not written off a sister, no matter how long she has been out of fellowship, no matter how long she has been out of touch, we must be concerned. We cannot write her off. We must seek for her spiritual welfare. There are other people, they have not gone, but they have one leg out and one leg inside because of their suffering, because of their sickness, because of the difficulty that they have, and their problems have not been well attended to. They are discouraged, they are depressed, they are crying, and they are sucking their tears every night. And they are wondering, will I remain in Christ? Will I remain in the kingdom? Or will I go out and go and help myself? The church cannot help me. My brothers and sisters look at me as a beggar because I ate in so-and-so's house last yesterday. I ate in sister so-and-so's house the other day. Everybody in the zone, when they look at me now, they know that I come to visit them at the time they are eating because I don't have any food. Everybody looks at me now as a beggar. And I used to be a prostitute. And I used to get money from men. And now since I caught up this work of prostitution, there is no money. And I don't have certificate. And I don't have job. And all these brothers and sisters are looking at me as a beggar. Will I stay in this kind of place? Everybody is looking at me with one kind of eye. Will I remain in fellowship? They have one leg outside, one leg inside. They are beginning to look for their old friends again. They are beginning to look for their old boyfriends again. And they are wondering, maybe if the church cannot help me, let me put my leg outside and help myself. What are we going to do about them? Are we going to say, I fed him for two weeks. I accommodated him for good six months. I accommodated him. So, if he cannot take care of himself now, good luck to him. That sister, uh, whatever she says now, I know how long I accommodated her. So if she wants to perish and go out, her blood is no more on me because I accommodated her for six months. And so if she goes now to prostitution and goes to boyfriend saying that, uh, well, nobody is caring for her. How about all the care we have given her before? If she perishes, she is on your neck, on your head. Because her blood will be required at your hand. Has somebody been discouraged and you know about it? Are you saying, ah, with all the message we had last Sunday, the message we had last Monday, 
the message of last Thursday, if anybody is discouraged now, that's their business. Because that message is enough to wake anybody up. Go and wake them up. Go and help them. Go and sit by their side. You are, the, you are your brother's keeper. You are your sister's keeper. Look at Jeremiah. Chapter 38. Jeremiah. Chapter 38. From verse 6. Then took they Jeremiah. And cast him into the dungeon. Of Malchair. The son of Hamilek. That was in the court of the prison. And they let down Jeremiah with cords. And in the dungeon, there was no water but mire. So Jeremiah sunk in the mire. Jeremiah now was isolated. He was taken away from the city, from society. And the persecution was so great, he was in the mire. His feet sunk, and his spirit must have sunk. His courage must have left him. All that he had before had sung and left him. But somebody cared. In verse 7. Now when Abed, Abed Melik, the Ethiopian, one of the eunuchs, which was in the king's house, heard that they had put Jeremiah in the dungeon. The king then, sitting in the gate of Benjamin, Abed Melik, went forth out of the king's house and spake to the king, saying, My lord the king, these men have done evil in all that they have done to Jeremiah, the prophet, whom they have cast into the dungeon and is like to die for hunger in the place where he is, for there is no more bread in the city. Ebed Melech spoke concerning Jeremiah. Jeremiah didn't know that anybody could speak for him. Nobody asked of his welfare. No friend, no nearby person, no acquaintance. All the people that he had helped before, nobody asked of him. You know, as zona leaders, they have labored much. And it will be unfortunate if they get into any problem and nobody asks of them. You know, our coordinators have labored much. It will be unfortunate. If when they get into any problem, maybe they have any family problem or family issue, and nobody asks of their welfare, it will be unfortunate. You know, our women representatives, they are laboring much. And if when they have any problem, maybe family problem, maybe the problem with their places of work, if nobody asks of their welfare, it will be unfortunate. You see, all the people that have been working, working in the same zone, working in the same area, working in the same section, maybe a full-time worker, they labor very much. They labor for the glory of God. If when they get into a problem and nobody asks of them, it will be very unfortunate. Jeremiah had labored much over the people, times of hunger, times of need, times of scarcity, even times of discouragement, even times when he said, I will not make mention of his name again. I will not preach his word again. And the word became fire within his bones, and he could not stay. And he started preaching again. And this time now, he was put in the dungeon, and his feet sunk in the mire. It would have been unfortunate if nobody asked of him. Do we ask of our brothers and sisters? Do we ask of their welfare? If, for example, we do not see some of our brothers and sisters in this workers' retreat, do we say they had the announcement? Didn't the pastor say about it last Saturday and encourage everybody to come? And if anybody did not come, that's his lookout. I thank God God has revived me. God has put something within me. I'm going to serve the Lord now. I don't want to look at the face of anybody. Those who didn't come, that's their lookout. Is it only their lookout? Are we not our brother's keepers? Are we not our sister's keepers? Are we not going to reach out to them and ask, Brother, why didn't you come? Sister, why were you not there? We had district meeting on Thursday night. 
We had district meeting on Friday night. And I looked for you, and I didn't see you. And the Lord blessed us in that workers' retreat. My sister, why were you not there? And then as a gift, you buy one of the cassettes for him. You say, I would have bought everything for you, but you know, I don't have too much money, but I, I'm giving you this. Please, my sister, my brother, listen to this. What a wonderful thing it will be that you are your brother's keeper, that you are your sister's keeper. And Abed Melik went forth on behalf of Jeremiah. And he said, King, if this man is left in that dungeon, he will die. He will die of hunger. He will die of all the germs in that dungeon. His feet is sunk in the mire already. What are we going to do? Verse 10. Then the king commanded Ibed Melek, the Ethiopian, saying, Take from thence thirty men with thee, and take up Jeremiah, the prophet, out of the dungeon. Before he died. Sometimes you do not, you cannot do it all alone. To bring Jeremiah out of the dungeon. Sometimes you cannot bring that brother out alone. That brother that has sunk in the mire. In the mire of discouragement. In the mire of despair and despondency. Sometimes you do not have the wisdom to do it alone. The energy to do it alone. The power to do it alone. The finance to do it alone. Sometimes you need three other people with yourself. So that the four people will take this man that has been paralyzed. Paralyzed by joblessness. Paralyzed by discouragement. Paralyzed by all the problems that have surrounded him. Sometimes it takes four people to carry that man that is paralyzed by the circumstances of life and bring him to Jesus. Sometimes you may need to carry him over the roof, over hurdles and difficulties, and bring him. Sometimes it will take more than four. It will take other 30 people in the zone joining you. And all of you will go to that man's house. All of you, 30 people, will go to that sister's house. And you will sing choruses, and you will pray with him, and you will read the word of God with him and you will weep over his neck, and you will weep over her neck, and all the neighbors will come and be looking at you and say, what's the matter? 30 of you? Is, did somebody die? You say, no, it's our member. We didn't see him for a long time. We are sorrowful. That's why we are crying. And the neighbors will join you to cry for him. And the man and his neighbors and everyone, you will come to church and rejoice. I have found my sheep that was lost. That's how to do it. When well, you cannot do it all alone. Reaching out to them, calling them, and telling them that they ought to come in verse 11. So Ibed Melik took the men with him and went into the house of the king under the treasury and took thence old cast cloths and old rotten rags and let them down by cord into the dungeon to Jeremiah. And Ibed Melik, the Ethiopian, said unto Jeremiah, Put now these old cast cloths and rotting rags under thine armholes, under the cords. And Jeremiah did so. And they drew up Jeremiah with the cords and took him up out of the dungeon. And Jeremiah remained in the court of the prison. That's how he did not die. They spared his life. Many people are about to die. They need urgent attention. Many people are about to die. They are waiting for us. What will be the reward? In Jeremiah chapter 39, verse 15. Now the word of the Lord came unto Jeremiah while he was shut up in the court of the prison, saying, Go, speak to Ibed Melech the Ethiopian, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, behold, I will bring my words upon this city for evil and not for good. And they shall be accomplished in that day before thee, but I will deliver thee in that day, says the Lord. And thou shalt not be given into the hand of the men that whom thou art, of whom thou art afraid. Brothers and sisters, if we wake up, if we rise up, and we reach out to the people that are perishing. And we bring them in. And we care for them. 
and we wash their sores. And we pour in oil and wine. And we pour in our tears and our love. And we recover them so that they do not die on the way between Jericho and Jerusalem. God says, He will deliver you from the hand of the people you are afraid of. And He says, In that day, deliverance will be yours. He will keep you as the apple of the eye of the Lord. Am I my brother's keeper? Yes, I am. Are you your brother's keeper? Yes, you are. Rise, do something before they die. Let's rise up and pray. They're waiting. Don't let them die. Many of them are about to die. Don't let them die. Some people are discouraged. Don't let them die. Some people have gone away for four years or 40 years. Don't let them perish. Rescue the perishing. Care for the dying. Get concerned. Look for them. Search for them. Win the souls. Don't feel unconcerned about the sinners around you. You are a watchman over the sinners around you. Preach to them. Witness to them. And over brothers and sisters, care for them, love them, weep over the erring ones, bring them back on your shoulder, get three other people with you, carry them back, get 30 other people with you. Bring them back by your love. They must come back. The Lord is about to come. Don't let them die in the wilderness. You are your brother's keeper. And you are your sister's keeper. We're reading verse 9. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Father, Lord Jesus, the lover of our souls, we cannot claim ignorance again. You have committed the souls of all men into our hands. And today, all you are saying is that we should rise up, we should wake up and go after the souls of men, both those that are yet in their sins, as well as those that are backsliding or lukewarm, or those that are thinking about going back because of one reason or the other. Father, the task is great. And tonight, Lord, we are not asking for the task that is equal our power, Lord, we are asking for the power that will be equal the task you have committed into our hands. Give it unto us in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, we cannot do this work alone. Lord, we cannot do this work with the energy of man. Savior, there's nothing we can do with you unless you go with us. When the sons of the prophets wanted to go to prepare a large thing so that others might come in, they asked you to go with them. And you were, and they asked, they asked Elisha to go with them, and he went with them. And their journey and their work was successful. Father, Lord Jesus, this we are asking for tonight. That as we go, go with us in Jesus' name. Father, whatever happened on the way, whatever happened at the spot, whatever head of the earth that we lost, Lord, with you, we know that you will see us through. Come and go with us in Jesus' name. 
Father, we pray that none of us here today will be negligent of this duty in Jesus' name. We are committing the souls of sinners around us into your blessed hand. Father, the wisdom, the understanding, the knowledge, the application of the word, the spirit anointing, come and give everything we need to us in Jesus' name. Father, much more than ever before, as we go out today, we are praying that souls of men will come into the kingdom in Jesus' name. Father, as we go back to backsliders, by the time we go, we, we go back to our zones, to our villages, to our localities, Father, we are praying they will come back into the kingdom in Jesus' name. Whatever will have made those people that have gone back to go back, whatever reason, whatever problem, whatever trial, Father, from tonight, as we go back to them, we are praying. You will give us all that we need to be able to bring them back in Jesus' name. Help us, O oh Lord. Walk with us, O oh Lord. Father, we are praying that on the day of reckoning, the blood of no man will be out from our hands in Jesus' name. But that will do everything possible to bring every soul back into the kingdom in Jesus' name. You will help us. You have assured us. You will go with us. You will back us up. Father, it is no longer your own problem, but our own problem. Therefore, Father, we pray, whatever is capable of hindering us, whatever is capable of standing a stumbling block on our way, in the name of Jesus Christ, remove all these things from our ways in Jesus' name. Father, you have changed us. You have really prepared us. Father, I am praying that none of us will lose this fire and this vision again in Jesus' name. Continue with us. By the time we shall finish this workers' retreat, Father, we are praying that you have made out of us that which you want every one of us to be in Jesus' name. We will not hinder you. We will not disallow you. Go on working in our lives. Go on preparing us. Go on empowering us. And we shall go for you. We will do the work. Your holy name will be glorified. Our lives and the lives of the people around us shall be blessed. And together we shall make heaven at last. Thank you.